they called him the Crucifix Killer. For weeks straight, the airwaves were saturated with stories of his capture. The Boogeyman Vanquished at Last. I'd personally found the title insensitive in light of his crimes, but it undeniably gave the public a quiet thrill, being able to target their fears onto something tangible. A name to the otherwise faceless villain in the shadows of our safe suburban neighborhoods. An unearthly creature. Stalking the night. Carving crosses into the bodies of his prey. In truth, the crucifix killer was a regular man in his 50s. Jedediah Reynolds of Jackson, Florida. Over 30 years, Mr. Reynolds had amassed dozens of murders across the country, all linked by their gruesome, uniform nature. The vast majority of his victims were men, mostly Caucasian, in the 25 to 60 age range, but he did deviate on occasion. There was one woman in particular, a beloved mother and active church member in Wisconsin, whose murder had garnered a great deal of coverage, more so than most of the other victims later attributed to Jedediah. For a while, local media outlets were clogged up with the gory details of his crimes. They pushed the limits of censorship, painting pictures pulled straight from a pulp fiction novel. He started with the throat, first a piano wire, then a knife in his later years. Once he'd overpowered his victim, he'd cut or claw out the eyes, then place them in his target's mouth. He finished with his signature cross, large and ragged, sliced deep into the chest after death. I probably wouldn't have taken note of any of it, if I'm being honest. I've never much cared for shock stories or true crime. Unfortunately, I was forced to pay attention on the crucifix killer murdered my father. My dad had been the last victim before Reynolds was caught. The entire event was broadcast on the evening news, though it hadn't been all that exciting to watch. An anonymous tip and some CCTV footage managed to close the case in a matter of days, but nothing else had come close in three decades. Reynolds hadn't even put up a fight upon arrest. And if anything, he looked relieved. Eyes cast down, tired, his withdrawn demeanor and fondness towards religious symbolism had people speculating. A devil made me do it defense in court. Just more fodder for the local board housewives. The detective on the case advised against me speaking to my father's killer, told me that Jed wasn't being particularly forthcoming anyway, and I was risking my mental health by potentially exposing myself to everything the man had done, which certainly wasn't a reach. Most people weren't mentally prepared for the reality of facing the murderer of a loved one. But from the moment I had been informed of my father's death, all I could think about was confronting this man. I needed to know why. Why did someone like my dad have to die? Now, growing up, my father had been the only one there for me, and even now, no one loved or supported me in the way that he did. He was always encouraging me, doting on me, and when my mom left us, he loved me twice as hard. My father was a good, gentle man. He was kind to everyone and didn't deserve such a heartbreaking fate. He'd been the sole person to truly believe me through all my ups and downs, and now he was gone. All I had in his stead was righteous fury and the need for answers. Katie Moore! The reception is called, rousing me from my web of thoughts that I'd spun while waiting to enter the visiting center. Here, I said, as she was taking roll call, and a flustered-looking woman with a clipboard buzzed me in. They made me leave my cell phone in the lobby, then sent me through a metal detector that led to a drab, chilly hallway. The atmosphere changed as they ushered me through the door to the visitor's room, a dismal, barren space full of miserable people, some in chains, some free. They spoke in little clusters, forced on one another and oblivious to the tears and hushed arguments at the table around them. Take a seat, one of the guards said, gesturing to a table in the corner. I looked around at his colleagues to find them distracted and uninterested, staring into space. I wondered what it must be like to grow up so accustomed to being surrounded by murderers that an individual couldn't even be bothered to keep an eye on what was happening around them. Burnout or apathy or both. The man walked away and my nerves spiked that much more. I tried to focus on the task at hand, but 
It only made my blood pressure rise. Seconds ticked by, and a pit formed in my stomach as I questioned my choice to come here for the first time. Was I really ready for this? Would it actually make any sort of positive difference? Maybe I was better off not knowing. It wasn't too late to back out. I could just get up and leave. But the doors to the left of me screeched open, and my chance was gone. A guard at either side. They marched him in. Jedediah Reynolds. The man whose face had been plastered on every television channel for the past two weeks. The last person to see my father alive. His head was down, eyes averted as they led him to my table, but for the jangle of his chains, the man didn't make a sound, allowing himself to be directed without protest. I watched as the guards secured his cuffs to the table, giving him just enough room for movement, but not enough for the illusion of freedom. One of the guards mumbled something about no touching, and then let us be, disappearing behind the heavy doors once more. And then it was just the two of us. Though the room was filled with people, I felt alone, staring at this man in person. He hadn't seemed real until now. Everything up until this moment had been a mere fantasy. Part of me had envisioned storming in, demanding the truth, shaking this man to his core. I wanted to know that I wasn't afraid of him, that he had to answer to me for his transgressions like I was the angel of justice herself. But now that he was across from me, hunched over and silent. I couldn't muster up the words myself. We sat like that for a while, unspeaking. Bits and pieces of conversations around us drifted to me. People arguing, people crying. I swallowed and glanced back at Reynolds. He still hadn't even looked at me. Do you know who I am? I finally asked. Reynolds didn't reply. I stared at him for a while, wondering if he could feel my eyes on him. If I stared long enough, would something crack? But he remained unchanged, head down as if in prayer, so I continued. You killed my father, I said, searching for a reaction, but there was none. He didn't flinch or move, he just kept staring down. I'm sorry for that, he said and I startled at the sudden reply. His voice was lower and more raspy than I'd imagined, older than his years, exhausted like he never slept. Then why did you do it? I asked after a moment, clearing my throat as I caught the first quiver in my words. I don't expect you to understand, he murmured in that same tired tone. I'm very sorry for the suffering this has cost you. I wish I could take your pain away. He was all I had, you know that? I said, through gritted teeth, my eyes burning. I'm alone now because of you. Another long silence stretched between us. Finally, Jedediah lifted his head, allowed me to see his creased face, his mournful eyes, the heavy bags that hung beneath them. I wish it could have been another way, he began. I know you can't possibly understand, but... His expression shifted as he focused on my face, startled, like he'd seen a ghost. I must have made the same expression, caught off guard by the change in his posture. It was like seeing an old rock come to life out of nowhere. Tears filled his eyes, and he smiled. He, he actually smiled. It's you, he said, his voice shaking. I, I've never gotten to, to actually meet one of you before. What? I snapped, glancing around at the guards who were paying us no mind. What are you talking about? Jedediah shook his head and lowered it again. Praise God, he told me. To be able to see you, it's the one blessing to come out of this burden. He caught my gaze and held it. Please, he whispered. With unnerving desperation, can I take your hand? I jerked away as if he'd tried to grab me. What? No! He stared for a moment, his smile fading and slowly nodded in acceptance. You're right, I'm sorry. The hell are you going on about? I demanded. How can you sit here and smile at me after murdering my father? 
Reynolds grew somber again, then stared down at his clasped hands. Several seconds passed, and I wondered if perhaps the man was done talking, then... I could tell you the truth. I owe you that much. He looked up once more. And even if you do... You probably won't want to hear it. The urge to strike the man rose in my chest. Why was I listening to the ramblings of some psychopath? Why, why had I let him rile me up in this way? He was playing with me, playing me into his delusions. But even so, even so, I couldn't fight the nagging fear that if I turned away from him now, I'd forever be haunted by the mystery. This could be the only way I'd ever learn the truth. I swallowed hard. Just tell me. Reynolds looked at me for a long moment, searching my face as if looking for cracks in my resolve. Finally, he closed his eyes and nodded. I learned as a young man that I have a gift, he told me. Truthfully, it's more like a curse. Such a cliche, I thought. But I felt like I knew where this might be going. See, I've come to understand that I was put on this earth for an important reason. Through God's will, I have the power to cleanse the land of evil. I stared at him without reaction. Maybe I'd seen too many cop shows, but it didn't surprise me. This guy thought he was... He was special. And the things he did were justified. It reminded me of something my father used to say regarding sick people who thought they were doing the Lord's work. Taking out the evildoers, you know. He said that they believed they were the hand of God doing his bidding on earth. It was the sort of darkness that could come out of religion and blind faith. Just a bunch of mentally ill folks, according to my dad. So he'd never believed in the supernatural. So my father had a demon in him, huh? I asked coldly. No, Jedediah said. It's not like that. Ever since I was a teenager, I... He hesitated and looked around. The first time he'd appeared nervous since he entered the room, it was like all the solemn broken man from before he just vanished. I know it's difficult to believe, but I swear it. When I touch a person, sometimes... Sometimes I see things. Things that haven't happened yet. I stared him down, unblinking. And he shifted beneath my gaze. I see... Things they're going to do. Just say it, I said, sick of the dancing around. If I touch the skin of a future murderer, I can see the crimes they have yet to commit. Jedediah searched my eyes, perhaps searching for a desired reaction. All those people, he murmured. I didn't want to kill them, but if I hadn't, they would have taken innocent lives. My expression didn't change, still incredulous and angry, but inwardly. I considered the pattern of victims that were connected with Reynolds. But I couldn't remember them all, but quite a few did seem to have an unsavory air about them. Wife beater, corrupted cop, an escalating pedophile, an embittered hermit who stalked women. Perhaps most damning of all, the mother in Wisconsin. Tributes to her had stopped completely after it was discovered that she'd been slowly poisoning her children and her husband for the insurance money. It didn't mean anything, of course. Jedediah could have found their information online, noticed a pattern, might have even tracked people down based on arrest records or, or internet forums. I mean, after all, though the ones who came to mind may not have been great people, there were plenty of others who'd been stand-up citizens. L like my father. You think I'm crazy? Reynolds said, pulling me from my thoughts. I understand, I do. I thought I was for a long time until it started to happen. I'd see the murders, and then I'd discover they'd happen. Just like I'd seen in my vision. Why not go to the police, then? I asked, leaning into my skepticism in an effort to ground myself. I tried to, I swear it. Jedediah said, mm. pleaded. 
There was nothing I could say to make them follow through. Without a crime, what was there to investigate? I realized that most of these people wouldn't be punished until they... The killing had already occurred. He gazed down at his hands again. So I did what I had to do. I considered what the man had said for a long time. It was insane to buy into such a story. I mean, this, this person was crazy. I was only hurting myself by indulging his fantasies. However, I couldn't help but linger on my next question. Would asking it be the same as accepting what Jedediah was telling me? Despite my hesitation, we both knew it was coming. I saw a reluctance on Jedediah's face before I had even spoken. So what about my dad? I finally asked. What was he going to do? Now it was Jedediah's turn to turn out the silence. He locked his gaze on the table, refusing to look at me, which only made me angrier. Tell me, I snapped. If I was going to put myself in this position by asking, he damn well was going to give me an answer. Jed raised his head again, and my gut clenched as I saw that he was crying. The words stopped in my throat. Was this remorse? Did he, did he regret what he had done? Now that he was forced to face the victim's family, I mean, was it fear of consequences finally setting in? Realization that perhaps he hadn't been spiritually guided to killing these people after all? More delusions? I didn't know how to proceed. But Jed did. It was you. I stared at the man. I felt my heart rate increase. I'm so sorry, child. I had no idea. No idea it was his own daughter. Something twisted inside of me. I wanted to ask him what he meant, but we... We both knew. You don't expect me to believe something that ridiculous, I said. And some distant part of me hoped that he'd tell me that I was right. I didn't believe him. I told myself over and over that I didn't believe him, yet... I couldn't stop the feeling of my insides twisting. There was no way he wasn't lying about all of it. The special ability, the visions, the murder itself. I could have easily brushed it off as, as more crazy ramblings, but some distant part of me couldn't shake Jed's words. Was it his sincerity? My own need to make sense of the nonsensical? It wasn't possible. Even if I was willing to buy into the supernatural crap, my father, my, my father loved me more than anything. I'm sorry, Jed said again. He seemed like such a good man, but when he shook my hand, I, I saw it. Him holding a pillow over the face of a girl crying as she fought against him. When she'd stopped moving, he lifted the pillow again and I saw her face. Your face. Tears glistened in his eyes as Jedediah struggled to finish the story. You were so young. I saw your lifeless eyes, your entire future snuffed out, and I had to stop him. Though I inwardly screamed that these were lies, I couldn't stop myself from imagining my father doing such a thing. I thought about the hands that lovingly brushed my hair, that, that wiped away my tears and comforted me when I was sick. The idea of those same hands turning on me. Ending my life. My stomach twisted again, battling a swill of nausea and fury. It was much harder than I expected to assure myself that none of this could be true. I hated Jedediah that much more for planting that uncertainty inside of me. I was stupid to come here, I said, standing sharply. Maybe it had been the grief that had me thinking I could find a... Some sort of closure in this. The loss had hit me too hard, and I would convinced myself that there was an answer that could take away some of the damage. But now, I was finding clarity, and I knew staying here a second longer was only going to make things that much worse for me. No, wait a moment, Jedediah said. Don't go yet. Please don't go. I, I've never been able to meet any of the people I've saved. Please just stay for a moment longer. I hope you live a long, long life, I told him coldly. Enjoy prison. Wait, please, he called. As I turned to leave, his fingers clasped around my wrist and pulled me back. My heart leapt into my throat and I whipped around, curses on my tongue. However, the rage leaked out of me the moment I saw Jedediah's face. 
The gaze between us was intense, enough to make me shudder, but I... I didn't look away. I focused on Jedediah's expression, the peculiar way his features had twisted. As I watched the look of shock in his eyes shift to violent panic, something shifted within me as well. My heart began to flutter, exhilarated. I couldn't help the smile that stretched across my lips. Old Jed was telling the truth. You. You. Jed whispered, eyes wide and horrified. My pulse raced, excitement danced through my veins to think that something like this could be real. I beamed at Jedediah, then leaned closer so no one else could hear us. You know, I honestly didn't think he had the guts to go through with it. I murmured, sure he was afraid of what I might do someday. But I've always been Daddy's little girl. It hurts a little to think that he was actually capable of killing me. Jedediah shook his head, his voice tight and raspy. You're a monster, I smirked. Are you sure? I asked. Or am I doing God's work? Hey, no touching, a guard belatedly shouted, and I jerked my arm from Jed's shaking hand. Thank you, though, Jedediah, I said softly. For saving me. And with that, I turned and walked away from him. Behind me, his screams echoed through the cement room. Don't let her leave, he shouted. You have to stop her! Oh god! Oh god, what have I done? The guards jumped to life at the disturbance, wrestling Jed to the ground amidst his crazed rantings. Stepping out of the prison doors, I turned my head to the sky. The sun was shining bright. The day was full of promise. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepasta. And I wanted to tell you, thank you for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you guys are watching on YouTube, then that means you can find the podcast on Spotify or anywhere else that you happen to listen to podcasts. And if you guys are listening on the podcast, hey, if you want to find some older episodes or a whole bunch of stories you've never seen before, you should check out youtube.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. And no matter where you are, I really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and hitting that bell reminder, just so that you can always find a new story as soon as it becomes available. And I want to give a big thank you, as always, to all of my Patreon subscribers on Patreon. Pa patron? All my patrons on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You are the ones that allow me to do stuff, like getting specific stories just for the channel. All those wonderful things that come from Dale Drake, those are because of all of you. If you guys want to see more of that, then I would really, really, really love if you guys could help support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta like some of these wonderful guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Silty K. Sterlerson, Zachary Graphius, It's All About That Folk and Music, Gorang Trimegacy, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchak, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Dabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Milver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Sicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, as well as everybody if you look down in the description, and everybody that can even just give one dollar to be able to help things out, I really appreciate it. If you guys would like to join this list of names that I horribly, horribly mispronounce, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and honestly, even you guys who just listen, you watch, you comment, you like, you subscribe, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And sweet dreams. <laughs>